Tony's just shouting over me, as he should. This is, this is your show. This is what happens when you let people drink in between events. It gets raucous. Um, so welcome to the formal ceremony in which we will dedicate the Professor Anthony J. Santoro classroom. Um, I, I did some welcomes earlier, but I, I, I want to welcome, um, give a special welcome to Anita Barr, um, who is here. Um, Anita uh, is the wife of our first uh, Associate Dean Gary Barr and a dear friend of Tony uh, and Pauline. She's been a, a, a great supporter of the law school uh, and of a memorial scholarship um, that uh, she established here in, in Gary's name. So, Anita, it's great to see you. Um, so, I guess we all knew this day was coming um, at some point, but I have to say it sort of snuck up on me. Uh, it doesn't seem like 25 years ago that I first met Tony for an interview in, in Washington where he used his superpowers to see in me what approximately 180 other law schools could not. Um, <laughs> from there, things sort of went downhill for a little while. Um, between that interview and arriving here uh, for uh, our first faculty meeting, I went to a retreat that was organized and, and hosted by Bruce Kogan. And while there, I almost killed Bruce and Jamie's dog. And for those of you who know them, you know that was a very bad thing. Um, the only bigger sin I think I could commit would have been to scratch one of Bruce's cars or <laughs> something like that. But I, I was not off to a great start. Um, and then when I arrived uh, to go to my first real faculty meeting where I would have the right to vote and, you know, carry on and object and be obstreperous as faculty occasionally do, um, Tony quit. Um, <laughs> and which to me, uh, and maybe I was, you know, out of the loop, uh, was both uh, unexpected uh, and somewhat unsettling. Um, but he quit to become president of the university, which was a, which was a good thing. Um, and he was succeeded as dean. As you might imagine, uh, he had someone in the wings waiting to be approved by the faculty uh, who helped finish the job of getting accreditation uh, for the law school in the shortest possible time. Um, during his presidential years, we had less contact. Um, but one interaction uh, stands out. As, as many of you know, uh, the opening of the law school uh, corresponded with the resignation in October of 1993, uh, not of Tony, but this time of the Chief Justice of the Rhode Island Supreme Court, uh, who was facing impeachment proceedings and criminal charges. And this was unfortunate, especially because uh, his predecessor had also been forced uh, to resign under a cloud just a few years before. So long story short, I had been asked by Common Cause Rhode Island to participate in uh, a judicial reform uh, movement and was about to write an op-ed that was critical of the status quo and the defenders of the status quo. And I was years from tenure, uh, and it dawned on me to ask Tony uh, to meet with me so I could get his advice um, about whether I should take this on. And he quickly agreed to see me. He listened to me, uh, he did not hesitate, and he quickly said, that's one of the reasons the law school is here. By all means, you have my support, do what you think is best. And judicial selection became uh, one of my long-lasting academic passions, but more importantly, uh, Tony showed me that day what it meant to stand up for academic freedom, which is not an easy thing to do when an institution is in its infancy, when it's trying to establish roots in unfamiliar terrain, uh, and where it's trying to win over um, not an insubstantial number of skeptics. So I could go on and on. Tony created the institution that has become my professional home, and Rhode Island has become my personal 
home. I was not comfortable saying this for a long time, but I am now out loud. My children are Rhode Islanders. Um, so I will always have a personal affection for Tony and for his work. But I want to say just a couple more things about Tony's character, about the things about Tony that bring us all here um, tonight. Before I became dean, I was for a time the associate dean for academic affairs, the chief cat herder. Uh, and Tony always said the same thing to me, and I, and I think my predecessors uh, and successors have had this experience. Uh, whenever I asked him about his teaching schedule, he said, I'll teach whatever you need, I'll teach it whenever you need it. Just tell me what's best for you. And I'm not kidding. Um, I'm, he always said that. And I can say with complete confidence that I never heard even a similar conversation, had a similar conversation <laughs> with another one of um, my colleagues. So <laughs> we know that Tony is generous and we know that he is humble. Second, uh, despite my many faults and despite the fact that I've been nominally in charge of his law school for over three years, he has never once done anything but support me. And I know he's there if I need him, uh, but he has never inserted himself. He is gracious and he is graceful. And finally, not for nothing, look at where his law school is today. We have successful alumni from across the country, people who came here as, as students with a dream, who are now pursuing it. Just this week, I was in the chambers of uh, Judge Rodgery Thompson in the First Circuit, and I was visiting three uh, of our alumni who are clerking uh, for Judge Thompson. Uh, and each one of them uh, had previously clerked for a member of the Rhode Island Supreme Court. Uh, we have become Rhode Island's law school, which creates unparalleled opportunities for our students. We take this for granted here now, but also this week, the Esther Clark Moot Court competition uh, was held in the chamber of the Rhode Island Supreme Court, and our students argued before uh, the court. The following evening in Providence, we had uh, a mentoring reception uh, that was sponsored by two of our student groups, the Multicultural Law Students Association and the Alliance, which is our LGBTQ student organization. And there were almost 70 students, alumni, judges, non-RWU lawyers there to connect. This is a remarkable community that Tony has created. Uh, he had the vision, he had the talent, and he had the energy to make this happen. So put simply, I think nobody has done more for this law school than Tony Santoro. Nobody, full stop, as they say. And dedicating that classroom in his honor, the classroom where he used to teach tax to a full house at 8.30 in the morning when he was president, uh, seems like the least that we can do. So, Tony, thank you for everything. Um, <laughs> And it's now my pleasure to welcome uh, to the podium my longtime colleague, professor, dean, twice interim dean, and lived to tell the tale, um, Bruce Coble. Um, so looking around the room, uh, I see Tony's family. Uh, and I see friends, and I see students, and colleagues. Um, and other than his family and Anita, I think I probably know Tony the longest of anybody in the room other than family and Anita. 
Uh, I met Tony 35 years ago, probably this week or close to it, when he came to interview for the deanship at um, what was then the Delaware Law School of Widener University, now Widener University uh, School of Law, Delaware, where I was already a new faculty member. Uh, and um, so that was 35 years ago. Um, and it was a, a wise decision that my colleagues and I made at Widener to hire Tony as our, our dean because he proceeded for the next um, 10 years to lead that school in its upward trajectory. Um, and it was 25 years ago, probably again this week, when Tony, who was already in Rhode Island doing the preparatory work for the starting of this law school, called me up and said, um, you ought to come up here and take a look at you know, what we're trying to do up here. I think you know, this might be a good fit for you. And I came up and um, I'm very glad that Tony made that call and asked me to come up here. Because it gave me an opportunity to continue working with um, a colleague who I uh, love and respect and admire. Uh, Tony has had a marvelous career in law teaching, marvelous, almost 50 years of law teaching. Um, he, he has taught, I think, at, I was going to say every law school in the country, but that's not true. Um, I, then I should say he started as dean at every law school in the country. But, I, Tony has taught at probably six, I think, law schools and has been involved in founding at least four law schools, in addition to having been um, the consultant at many other, probably dozens of law schools and colleges and universities uh, have sought his guidance as they prepare to either start a law school or uh, start new programs. Um, but one of my, you know, best recollections of Tony is um, because his first year as dean at Widener was 1983, and he taught tax, which I taught, because like Tony, I have an LLM in tax from Georgetown, and I was teaching tax back in the day before I got my mind straight and <laughs> stopped teaching tax. Um, and Tony was teaching, um, I think it was business tax and business planning, you know, one of the one or the others in the fall of 1983, and I was teaching Fed tax and probably estate and gift tax or estate planning, something like that. And I um, asked Tony if I could come in and watch him teach. You know, I I was in my second year of full time teaching, although I had taught as an adjunct for a little while before that. And Tony was, was then a good dozen or more years in, into teaching, maybe 15 years into, into law teaching. And um, watching Tony teach that class uh, in a pretty um, big, and it was very highly tiered classroom that we had at Widener, the big one, you know, was, was a pleasure. Just watching somebody who was clearly a gifted law teacher. And at his core, you know, at least what I've known over the last 35 years, Tony is a great law teacher. He's done a lot of other things. He's been involved with a lot of other organizations, a lot of community work. You know, he has um, chaired the Rhode Island Student Loan Authority for a long, had, had done that for a long time. Um, he created the MCLE system for Rhode Island out of whole cloth, you know, and I've been serving on the commission ever since he put me on the commission, you know, um, and that's a long time ago, 20 some, 24 years ago. Um, and, you know, he, he, he wisely married the beautiful Pauline Plant, you know, and um, has, you know, four beautiful children who I remember growing up as little kids 
you know, Lynn and AJ and Lauren and Annie. You know, I remember following them and, you know, as they progressed along. But at his core, you know, he's, he's a, a great law teacher who chose to teach tax and business law. Um, not an easy choice, you know. None of what we teach is easy to teach, but that's clearly kind of like, um, if teaching law is like monopoly, then teaching tax law is like risk. You know, it's like a much more complicated game set. Uh, and, you know, that was a tough choice. Um, Tony's students, you can see from today's uh, panel discussion, adore him, and for good reason. Um, he is still, after almost five decades, excited when he walks into class. You know, he is still, you know, trying to figure out the, the next best way to get students to be just as excited about reorganizations and mergers and um, distributable net income and all of that. Um, and that is absolutely infectious. Um, so, you know, he has inspired generations of people who have gone on to contribute in many, many ways to their communities and to their clients. Um, among his colleagues, he has been the best friend we could have for the law school while he was the president of this law school, and he has been um, a terrific friend to me over all of these years. But it is a teacher, you know, he is a, a, an exemplary law teacher who, uh, who embodies uh, a a teaching philosophy that I've done a little bit of reading about over the years from a guy named um, uh, Parker Palmer, who, who has a book out, it's the title of which is, You Teach Who You Are, Not What You Know. And Tony has always done that. He has always demonstrated to his students his core value of wanting them to be as excited about the work and as excited about becoming the best lawyer they can be. So I join Michael, and I'm sure all of the rest of us, in saying thank you to Tony for what he has done for this law school on the dedication of the Professor Anthony J. Santoro classroom. Um, and I, I think it's appropriate that we recognize um, this man of substance who has definitely affected in the most positive way all of the rest of us. So um, I now will introduce my colleague, Louise Tights. I am honored to share this occasion Notice that I carefully said I am honored, I am not happy. I, like many of my colleagues, including Emily Sack, really are not happy that you're leaving, Tony, and we are hoping that you will drive Pauline crazy and she will banish you back to the law school. So there's, there's, that, there's still that hope. Um, I want to talk about Tony Santoro, my boss, my colleague, my mentor, and my friend. I've now known Tony only for a quarter of a century, but that sounds like a long time. Um, I met Tony in July of 1992, right after he had become dean of Rhode Island's first law school. I am from Rhode Island, I'm from Newport, and I was home from Illinois for a family event and I arranged to meet Tony. Tony, who I'd learned uh, about from colleagues elsewhere, either was loved or hated. There was no middle ground. <laughs> Tony, whom I, Dean at Illinois, referred to as the Johnny Appleseed of law schools, 
Tony and I talked about Roger Williams and his vision, and I was really excited to be part of Rhode Island's first law school since I remembered as a child when even Brown had talked about one, but they never did it. We also commiserated about what it was like, or in my case, would be like, to move back home as grown adults and live with one's mother. <laughs> he, his was a typical Italian mother. Mine was a typical Jewish mother. And I can assure you there is a great overlap of traits, <laughs> especially that one called guilt. Um, in the same conversation, by the way, he asked me, so how are you going to handle it when all these people that call you and want you to use pull Rhode Islanders to get into the law school, and these are all going to be friends of my first cousin at the time who was a big Rhode Island politico. In fact, he helped indict the first, or rather impeach the first judge, Bella Lacqua. And I, he, I said, well, I don't think I know people. And he said, you'll never be on the admissions committee. That will solve it. And I have to say, in almost 25 years, that is the only committee I have never served on. So my mother, by the way, adored Tony. He walked on water because he could do no wrong, because he was the person who got me to come back to Rhode Island, and <laughs> rightfully so. so I signed up, and my former dean at Illinois warned me and said, you know, this is Johnny Appleseed. Tony might, Tony might come and, you know, plant a few seeds and move on in five years. And I thought, nah, Tony is coming home to Fall River, Pauline is coming home to Tiverton, and I'm coming home to Newport. So I figured that he wouldn't just pack up and leave. And of course, my former dean wasn't totally off base because as Michael told you, at our first faculty meeting, he said, I'm leaving. The smoke has risen from the, from the chimney, the white smoke, and I'm about to be, and, and I being a nice Jewish girl didn't know the reference. Somebody had to explain it to me that this was the Pope. Um, then he was going to go across campus and he said that we would get an opportunity to choose the dean the next time, but he was bringing in someone to get the job done temporarily, and five years later we did get to choose our dean. Tony, my colleague. So Tony taught the basic tax course, as you heard, every year to our students, even while he was president and chancellor. He'd teach early, and he would leave early, and I would stalk his parking space. <laughs> and, I, and, and yes, parking was a problem even then, after year two. And I'd wait while he had his cigarette, and occasionally he'd have two. Um, but I was totally thrilled when he came back after being president and chancellor, and I was finally able to have him as my colleague, which I had expected on day one until we got that surprise. Um, I'm not going to say anything about his teaching because everybody else has said it, and the fact that so many of his former students come back and are here, and that that in itself, I think, is a testament to his teaching and his ability to inspire passion for learning in all things, tax. I mean, that is not something that I could ever get passionate about. Um, as a colleague, you always knew where Tony stood. If he didn't agree, he would tell you, and he would tell you to his face, to your face, rather, rather than talking about it to somebody else. I respected his, and do respect, his honesty and candidness, traits that are increasingly in short supply. And as the years has go have gone on, Tony and I have commiserated about changes in the legal education field, in the new generation, in technology, and Jim Galeb knows this. Tony and I, as fellow Luddites, 
are about as flustered by technology as we can be. And once you leave, I'm going to be the only one. So this is not good. At least now they say, oh, yes, Tony was down yesterday with this problem. <laughs> Tony, my mentor. Um, Tony has been my mentor, and he's been a mentor to most of my colleagues through the years. A mentor with whom you can share confidences and ask advice, and you know that it will never go outside of his office. In fact, he was the person I confided in and asked for advice when I was offered the appointment in, in The Hague. Tony also can be brutally honest. He will say, I think you're crazy to do this. He said that to me earlier this week. <laughs> but he will also offer support and advice once you've managed to create a mess because you didn't listen to his advice the first time. And he never says, I told you so. Um, and finally, I guess that best of all, Tony and Pauline are my friends. We've shared happy times and we've shared losses of colleagues like Gary and Esther. But we are all a family. In fact, I think that really is what Tony has created, a Roger Williams family. And it is impressive how Tony, when he was president, knew everyone. You heard one of his former students say that when she was an undergraduate, he knew her name. Um, but he knew everyone at Roger Williams. He knew everybody who worked here, who their kids were, how their families were doing, and he'd always ask that. And so, sort of the one story that to me captures who, who Tony is. One day I stopped by the dean's office. I was gonna talk to Bruce. It was in one of his interim periods. And the office was being painted. And Tony was asking the worker who was painting it, so how's the family? And this seemed like a normal question he might ask any of the Roger Williams employees, his Roger Williams family. So I was totally surprised when Tony turned to me and say, said, oh, you know AJ, my son, right? <laughs> Tony treated those he worked with and those who worked for him with the respect and care that he showed his own son and his family family. He started with a small family here at Roger Williams, and we've grown over the 25 years. The campus that you could cover in a 10-minute stroll in 1993 has become a university that now takes at least 30 minutes to cross or more. I probably walk much slower than I did in 93, too, but I guess the apple seeds that you put down have grown strong roots that many have built on. So we will miss you, Tony. And now, Tucker Wright from across the campus. Again, it's an honor to be asked to, uh, to speak here today. And um, <clears throat> I've known Tony for, for 25 years. Let me, let me tell you how it came about. Um, and I, I was proud and privileged to have a little something to do with the, setting up the law school. <clears throat> um, a number of years ago, I was having coffee with President Sicaro from the university. And he was, uh, he was uh, talking about how he created a medical school where he was before. And I said to him, you know, we don't have a law school in Rhode Island. And his eyes opened up. <laughs> okay. And, um, and at the time, we had, a, we had a paralegal program, a criminal justice program, undergraduate. <clears throat> so he said, what do you do? What do you do? I said, well, you have to, what you have to do is form a feasibility study with the American Bar Association. And I said, right, let me give you an idea. Call Justice Weisberger. Right? And thank, thankfully, Justice Weisberger uh, agreed to, to, to share the committee. I was on the, on the feasibility committee. It met for 
close to two years. Uh, right at the beginning, <coughs> Tony was recommended to be the consultant uh, on the committee, and we worked diligently. We met many times. We had, uh, it was about a 12 or 13 member, member committee, <coughs> and he put together an excellent report uh, based on the, on the findings that we came up with. And um, uh, we, we had to meet with the Supreme Court of Rhode Island to, to give the presentation. And it was at that meeting that Ralph Pepito was there. Now I know poor Ralph had his problems, but believe me, he was a driving force of this law school. Uh, and I said to him, where's the money gonna come from? He said, don't worry about the money. You people get this approved by the Supreme Court and we'll go. And uh, he, he got together uh, with, his, with his financial consultant, Mr. Gabelli, down in New York, and somehow or other <laughs> came up with the money and built this building uh, within budget, on time, right? Uh, and uh, the, uh, then, uh, you know, the <clears throat> they had decided to go ahead with the law school, so now they were seeking a dean. And um, I, I asked uh, President Sucuro, I said, did Tony Santoro apply? And he said, no. So I called him, I don't know if you remember this. <laughs> and I, I had done some research and realized they were from around here. And I said, uh, Tony, it's time you came home. And of course, <laughs> Humble Pie said, well, I shouldn't really apply because I was a consultant. I said, that doesn't matter. <laughs> right? So he applied and, and, and that, that was history. Um, and, uh, you know, the, uh, um, especially Justice Weisberg, he did a great job in, in helping put, put the uh, whole th situation together. The, the advisory committee was a little interesting, too. We had a, we had a couple of um, developers on the committee, and one of them wanted to build a law school up, up, in the, up in a mill up in Providence, you know. And so we had to bring the ABA down and say, no, 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 no. We're gonna, you should build it on campus, which, which fortunately, fortunately happened. Uh, so the, uh, uh, as far as the, uh, the, the cons finally, you know, Tony agreed to, to be here from law school and, and uh, we've had enough comments about his teaching abilities. I think it's experienced by the panel was here today, the quality of the students that, that went, went through your classroom. Um, I must say that uh, <laughs> I finally got the baddest, baddest compliment, best compliment in my life one day. We're having lunch uh, at, at, uh, with one of, his, one of the admissions lady, all right? And uh, he introduced to me, he said, this is Tucker Wright, he's the father of the law school. I, 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 Tony, you are the father of the law school. <laughs> okay, and uh, so, so uh, that's the end of my remarks. I'd like to introduce uh, President Farish from the university. Well, I have to confess that until today, I've actually never met Anthony. Uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is my first, first time um, in uh, meeting my, my predecessors, so that's not true. Um, but, but the point is, <laughs> we've had people talking about uh, knowing Tony Santoro for 25 years or 35 years. I've only known him since the time that I arrived. But I want to talk ab about him in a different context, uh, in his role as uh, the president of this university. Uh, you heard the story that um, back in, in 92, he was offered the job of dean, and it took him only just a few months, apparently, to impress the powers that be that he was being wasted as a dean. He needed to be the, <laughs> the president of the university, and he, he did that for the, between 1993 and 2000, and then he was actually the chancellor of the university for a year. I, 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 he may have been the only chancellor. I don't, I don't think that term, title has been used again. So. Uh, he is the first and the retiring ch chancellor of the university. But what was um, really quite remarkable, in addition to the fact that he founded the law school and all of the work that was involved in making that happen, he had quite a remarkable career as a president of this university. And, and one of the things that pr presidents, when they come to universities, always wanted to scout out first is how many retired presidents are still hanging around the neighborhood? Um, <laughs> 
in my last job I had two, and that was a, it took a little extra work to watch where they were at any given moment. But, but <laughs> on this university, just one, and, and the, the issue there is, is the president still acting like he's pretty much still the president? And, and that makes life a little difficult. That is not who Tony Santoro is, and I think you could assume that to be true if you know him at all. Uh, he has been nothing but gracious and, and helpful. A few times that I've, I've wanted to speak with him about some issues that were historic in nature that I just need to get a little better understanding of, he was right there. But he has never uh, offered any hint of criticism or, or anything that would sound like, well, I would have done it differently. That's just not in his nature. And I, I, I can't tell you how much I've appreciated that, Tony, because it's, it's a tough enough job coming in as a, as a new president where you're inheriting a culture and a whole a um, bunch of folks who are pretty comfortable with each other, um, but stepping aside as you did uh, was just made li my life a whole lot easier. Tony himself, as the president, as I look at what his accomplishments were, and I should tell you this, this story. I was at URI for four years, between the years 1979 and 83, and my brother-in-law at the time actually graduated from Roger Williams, and I remember it as being a very small place, which was true in 1983. Um, so coming back and seeing it uh, in 2011, I was taken aback by how much it had grown. And uh, as some of you know, I, I'm a lawyer myself, or at least I, I went to law school and passed the bar. I, I, I wouldn't really call myself a lawyer. Um, and I had always assumed that I would be at a school that had a law school, and I never was until I came back to Roger Williams. And because of Tony Santoro, I finally got to be at a place and as a law school, of course, by now I'd forgotten everything I ever knew about law, but at least symbolically it was important. But the decision uh, to start a law school, I think, changed the trajectory of this institution. But it wasn't enough for Tony just to do that and hope for the best. Think of the things that he did while he was here. The Feinstein School of Arts and Sciences, College of Arts and Sciences, came into being. The Gabelli School was renamed for, uh, for Mr. Gabelli. He started the honors program. We started bringing in international students. Um, there was a, a tremendous growth of the undergraduate population. He began the first graduate program. Uh, there was a, he, he acquired the, uh, the Metro Center in, in downtown Providence, which was an interesting way of kind of returning to our roots because that's where the school began back in 1956. And that Metro Center, we've since uh, transformed into not the same building, but the whole idea of being a Providence campus is now manifest with our One Empire uh, uh, Plaza building, which is a, a, an even larger version of, of how we're interfacing with the population of urban Rhode Island. My point is that presidents leave behind tangible legacies. And ideally, what happens is they're built in such a way that they become a foundation for the next president, so that we're not tearing things down in order to build, we're building on top of what was there. And I'll say that the work that Tony Santoro did as president created an enormously strong foundation for this university. So while I've had the pleasure of adding to the work that he did, it certainly wasn't in substitution for. And I think what happens as a consequence, universities just get stronger and better. So I want to thank you for having started that uh, work, Tony. I think you, as much as anybody, um, built the university, not just the law school, but built the university that we are here celebrating today. Lots of help, of course, but the leadership came from you, and the vision came from you, and, and the idea that this place had something singular to offer, uh, I think, is very much, again, a continuing part of your legacy. I'm going to tell a little story about, about Tony. He's, he would probably tell it himself, but you'll thank me for telling it, because I'll be shorter than he will. And so, um, <laughs> it, I know him that well. Uh, it's always a pleasure hearing Tony. He's a wonderful raconteur. Um, but but uh, the story is that when he was down at Widener Law School, a telephone call came in, and a secretary came to him and said, Tony, your, your ship has come in. Malcolm Forbes is on the phone. And Tony said, Malcolm Forbes? This is remarkable for two reasons. One is, I didn't even know 
that he knew that I existed. And the second is, he's dead. <laughs> so there was that issue. Um, well, it turns out, as luck would have it, there was another Malcolm Forbes. He just happened to be the provost at Roger Williams University offering Tony a job. And this was an enormous letdown that it wasn't the other Malcolm Forbes, but, but as a consolation prize, he agreed to take the, take the job. And so, Tony, it may be that your ship didn't come in when Malcolm Forbes called, but our ship did when you said, thanks, I'll take the job and come up to Roger Williams. Thank you so much for all the work that you've done. And now a, a graduate from the first law school class and currently a member of uh, our law school board of directors, Steve McGuire. I'm going to channel Mr. Coughlin from the first group and say I'm a little freaked out right now. <laughs> I've been around uh, the law school for a long time, and uh, holy smokes, you know, the panel that was here today, uh, the list of speakers that just went, and uh, kind of feel like I snuck in. Um, uh, thank you to uh, Daniel Nosky for, uh, for this opportunity. Uh, I was a little heartened when I sat next to uh, President Farris, and he also had notes, but show off that he is, he left them on the, on the desk. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I have my notes. And, uh, I remember giving my mother grief when I was 22 years old, and I had just come home from uh, an epic summer in California, living with some cousins and an aunt and uncle that I really didn't know. And I told my mother, how can you let 20 years go by? And you only saw your sister a couple of times. I only met these guys a few times. How do you do that? You know, and she looked at you like your mother looks at you and says, uh, it goes by fast and you don't even know what's happening. You'll see. You know, so here we are, 24 years and two months after a hot blue sky day in August that seems like yesterday. I was uh, <laughs> coming down Medicom Avenue listening to President Santoro talking to Arlene Violet on the radio <laughs> about this new law school, how exciting it was that they were finally coming, students finally coming. You know. And it was about two weeks after that, I brought a visual aid, but I left it on the uh, desk, you can see it later. Uh, we had a picnic and a softball game, and it's uh, on the cover of the Rhode Island, what was it, the journals, Rhode Islander magazine. And if you see in the picture, there's no grass in front of the school yet even. We were in the building, but there was still no grass, no trees or anything. And I was there with my uh, mother and my father and my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, and we were walking up to the building, and out comes President Santoro. And uh, I guess he was Dean Santoro still at that point. It was uh, probably two days before he quit. So. <laughs> but he came out, and he walked down the, uh, the, the cement paths were finally cement. They weren't planks anymore. And he walked down the cement path, and he gave one of his very dramatic, hey, Steve, how you doing? And he chatted with us for a minute. I introduced my parents. And then down the hill, he went to the next group to say hello. And uh, my wife, Laura, says, you know the dean? And I, maybe, maybe <laughs> it was Professor Worf who was just with us who went in the same door that he came out. I don't know. But the point is, 
he made you feel special. He made you feel welcome. Um, I was one of the uh, non-traditional students in that first class. There were a bunch of us. That were, there were, uh, I turned 30 during my first set of exams. Uh, and there were differences, certainly, between the non-traditional students and the traditional students that were there, and young students, old students, you know. And uh, I remember one lady, a couple of weeks into the class, classes, she was in her late 50s, and she was amazed. She loved the place. She said, just think, two weeks ago, the only thing I had to worry about was am I going to play bridge or golf? <laughs> but by the time the second year rolled around, young and old, traditional, non-traditional, uh, we could agree on one core principle. And that was 8 o'clock in the morning is a god-awful time to try to learn tax law. <laughs> You know. <laughs> but when you're the president and you still fashion yourself a professor and you want to teach tax, that's when you do it. <laughs> um, tax was never going to be my thing. Uh, whether it was 8 in the morning or 8 at night, it was never going to be my thing. Uh, and in fact, as great as he is, the, really the only thing I ever learned from President Santoro is that you have to keep a dirty office. <laughs> he said it during one of his... Uh, introductions here. You have to have a dirty office, a place where you can actually do your work and you don't have to clean up after yourself. <laughs> and I heard that you might be able to sneak a cigarette in there once in a while. <laughs> but I enjoyed uh, his class, even though it was tax, the way I enjoyed property, even though it was property, because of the teacher. You know, he was a great person, a great storyteller, a great uh, success, obviously. Uh, and between him and Dean Huber, they could tell stories that made even tax law, even property, bearable. <laughs> so, um, most, mostly, both of them were very good at, and are still good at, uh, name dropping. And the names they most often drop are the folks that were sitting at the table Today, he, he always talked about his students, you know. I've been hanging around the law school a long time, uh, maybe because I'm afraid they won't let me back in if I stop coming down here. But uh, I think it's that that inspires people, like Brian Ali, who uh, was the instigator for this lecture series, that, and the, the folks that uh, were here today. Uh, there is an actual reverence, sort of, for Professor Santoro. Um, everyone knows the history of the place. We've heard some of it, you know. Uh, if you were here in the beginning, you heard Mr. Pepito tell you the history of it several times. <laughs> you know, and uh, it was <laughs> Maybe four or five times I <laughs> heard the history. And uh, even Jack Palance doing push ups couldn't shorten the history sometimes. But <laughs> it's, a, it's a good history, and it, it's a great history. And, you know, it, it's a tremendous credit to both President Santoro and Mr. Pepito that, that the school is even even here, because it was just a crazy idea for a long time. If you live in Rhode Island, you know it was just a crazy idea for a long time. You heard that it was going to happen, it wasn't going to happen, PC was going to do it, Brown was going to do it, nobody's going to do it, and then we did it. So, and if you've been around, you know his history, and this is the fourth one that he's been involved in, and uh, obviously, I think he did a good job at those other places, but he saved his best work, you know, for us. <clears throat> um, so today is, you know, time for recognition, finally. For, I've been here a long time, like the proverbial bad penny on, or the gum on your shoe, which means I've eaten a lot of fancy snacks and even a lobster once with President Santoro. And 
many of the other great people here, Dean Logan, uh, Dean Logan, Dean Kogan, <laughs> Professor Tights, and uh, Mike Yanoski. And if you see the picture later, um, I'm the only one who still looks the same. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. <laughs> anyway, it was, it's interesting to hear all of the coming home parts of this story. And because it's Rhode Island, you know, at all of these different events, and the best two events that I've gotten to attend uh, are the last uh, two commencements, where uh, uh, Dean Kogan and President Santoro uh, finally got a diploma from here. <laughs> so, and I got to meet both of their families, and uh, as, uh, because it's Rhode Island, I worked with somebody who works with his daughter, you know. And uh, it's just been so great to see, see them both have a chance to uh, pat each other on the back for all the hard work that they did and the great work that they did. And uh, I think it's a tribute to their uh, friendship, the depth of their commitment to each other, that uh, I caught Mrs. Santoro weeping on the side of the tent as her husband was telling Bruce Kogan stories last year. So, as my mom said, it goes by fast and you don't even know it. So, I interviewed President Santoro for an article I wrote for the alumni magazine in honor of the 10th anniversary of the school, which apparently was 14 years ago. <laughs> and here's what we said back then. I said, people who know him thought he was crazy when they when they learned that the law school's founding dean and president, Anthony J. Santoro, was planning to retire and take on the comparatively sedentary life of a tax law professor. Everybody said I would hate it, he said, that I wouldn't have enough to do. But not only do I have plenty to do, I don't have any time to do it. <laughs> if I may be so bold, I'm going to try to teach you something about the three R's. And I'll do it in the form of an equation, so maybe you can understand this time. <laughs> Retirement equals rest plus relaxation. It's a prize, not a punishment. <laughs> so today is, today is payday, not only for him, but for me, uh, as one of the 3,000 160 graduates. Because <clears throat> I get to do what I always wanted to do and publicly say thank you. I give you President Santoro, <laughs> Professor Santoro, <laughs> Dean Santoro. sit down. Thank you very much. I, I, I really, I, I came prepared with a history of the law school. I thought I would be <laughs> spending some time here, but I don't think I'm going to uh, use it, and I don't think I will take very much of your time. This has been um, a very long program and one that I have enjoyed very, very much. They all lied, of course, but uh, I, I appreciate that. Seriously, I do want to take this opportunity to express my appreciation for all the speakers, for all of the very kind things that they said. And while I will accept their accolades, and I do very much appreciate Dr. Farish and Dean Yalnowski and the Board of Trustees of the University and the Board of Directors of the Law School for naming the classroom uh, after me or in my honor. In fact, it was my favorite classroom in those 8 o'clock, 8.30 uh, meetings. I, I just enjoyed that classroom. But the reality of all of this is that what was accomplished was actually accomplished by a whole bunch of people. Uh, we would not have the law school were it not for the vision of the Board of Trustees. We wouldn't have a law school were it not for the efforts of some 
very good friends of the university who formed three advisory committees. Remember, Tucker? Three advisory committees to uh, advise the university as to whether or not the law school should be established. One of those, of course, was chaired by uh, then Justice Weisberger, and they put enormous hours in. Uh, it's also true that uh, we would not have had the right to grant a degree if it weren't for the Rhode Island Board of Higher Education stepping in, thanks to the then Chairman Judge Leach. And of course, it's also a tiny band of faculty that came together to put together a library, a curriculum, and things of that sort. Uh, three of them are still here. Dean Kogan, Professor Tights, and of course, Dean Yelnoski. But they're getting rid of me, apparently. Uh, <laughs> so, I don't know. And there were, as a matter of fact, uh, others that joined us, and we, we remember them fondly. They've passed on. Dean Gary Barr, our first uh, academic associate dean, was mentioned. Uh, Dick Huber, the former dean at Boston College, came in to help us. And Ray Gallagher, my former professor at Georgetown Law School, came in to help us. And we remember them fondly because they played an important role in uh, what we do, or what we've started. But then, of course, there was Steve McGuire and a hearty band of law students who came and took the plunge at an unaccredited uh, law school, but we succeeded. Uh, we got the accreditation. Um, I, I have to correct a few things, though. Um, I, I wasn't dean when you came in. I had already been made president. <laughs> you had no dean. Uh, <laughs> I, I also have to, uh, Louise Tights probably disclosed this deep secret that I have held. The only reason I took the job as president and gave up the job as dean is, oh, I could move out of my mother's house. <laughs> I knew the president had a house, okay? <laughs> so I took it. Um, in any event, uh, I was going to talk to you about Malcolm Forbes, but Dr. Farish took that over for me, so there's not much I can do about that, but it is a true story. Um, I have had a, a great deal of time to, this semester at least, to think about retirement. Uh, I've been cleaning out my office, um, sort of separating out my books and uh, cleaning out my files. I've been sending old files to various people. Um, People have told me what I'm going to do in retirement. I should take up golf. I should uh, take up photography. I should plant a garden. I should mow the lawn. Things that I've tried to avoid for 75 years, <laughs> they want me to do now, okay? And what is this rest and relaxation, okay? Every time someone talked to me about retirement, my mind went to one single story about Justice Holmes that I remember reading about years and years and years ago. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, as you know, uh, was a Justice of the Supreme Court and acting Justice, acting Chief Justice for a while as well. Uh, but he was uh, on the bench until his late 80s or even 90 maybe. But apparently one day when he was pretty old and still on the bench, he apparently boarded a train at Union Station in Washington headed north. As soon as he got on the train, he went to the uh, parlor car, he took off his coat, he took off his uh, jacket, he sat down, he pulled some papers out from his briefcase, and he started poring over these papers. He was obviously engrossed in his work. The conductor, recognizing Justice uh, Holmes, didn't really want to bother him, but he needed to get Justice Holmes' ticket. So he waited a while, but then he decided to interrupt, and he said, excuse me, Your Honor, but may I please have your ticket? Well, Holmes fished into his uh, jacket pocket, his coat pocket, his vest pocket. He opened up his briefcase, couldn't find it at all. And the conductor, recognizing that uh, Justice Holmes was getting stressed out, uh, decided to say, don't worry about it, Justice Holmes. As a practical matter, when you sign it, just send it into the main office. Whereupon, Justice Holmes stood up, 
glared at the conductor and said, you dolt, I don't give a damn about your ticket. I just want to know where I'm going. <laughs> and that's the way I feel like now. I want to know where I'm going. In two weeks, I will be 50 years at the bar, 47 years as a uh, academic, as Bruce pointed out, 46 years as a husband. Now, I don't know what's going to happen to me in the future. I am not taking up golf, I'm not taking up photography, but I do have one big fear after the university has honored me and naming the classroom and bestowing upon me the rank, if you will, of President Emeritus and Professor Emeritus. I'm deathly afraid that after two months of feeding me breakfast and lunch, Pauline's going to make me Husband Emeritus. <laughs> uh, so, look, w w without more, I since the, the sun is over the yard arm in any event, so maybe we shouldn't go any further. But thank you very, very much for all of you who have been so instrumental in my having the best time of my life during these last 25 years, especially the last few as faculty member. I really enjoyed the classroom, and I am so thrilled to have that classroom named after me. Thank you all. Appreciate it. So please, let's continue this celebration. We will be moving outside uh, into the atrium for uh, drinks and some food. At some point during uh, the next half hour, we will cut the ribbon on uh, what is now the Santoro uh, classroom. And if anyone is interested, at 7.30 or so, people will be uh, headed to Aden's. So please join us there as well. Thank you all very much.